Welcome to Keeping the Lights On. I'm your host, Todd Reed, and on this podcast, I connect with the owners and pros who design, build, and maintain our electrical, communications, and industrial world to explore the best ways forward. I was recently in Europe and was blown away by the beautiful interaction between walkers, bikers, and cars, especially in Amsterdam and Den Haag. In addition, as I was enjoying enjoying the view outside of the train, I love seeing people biking and walking through much of Europe. It appears you can walk and bike through most of the continent. So it just got me to thinking about how my town and my local broader community either supports or doesn't support walking and biking and what could be done to help. In addition, I've lived in small towns and cities that have seen changing demographics through lost jobs and depopulation and again wonder, is there an answer? So I decided to turn to a longtime friend, Kevin Klinkenberg, executive director of Midtown KC Now, to look at the latest thinking in renewal in our communities from small towns to large cities. Kevin's background includes architecture, urban design, consulting, blogging, and podcasting. From the beginning, Kevin's focus his energies on those who aim for successful walkable and sociable places. And I am super excited to have this fellow Jayhawk on this episode. Let's get into the show. We start out each episode uh, discussing the meals that bring us together. So, Kevin, if I were to visit you, where might you take me and why would you choose this? (laughs) Well, uh, I mean, if you're in Kansas City, you have to do barbecue. If you have, you know, one meal to do, it has to be barbecue. It's the barbecue capital of the world. Uh, uh, Sorry to anyone else who thinks otherwise. Um, But, uh, you know, there's a million great places uh, I think uh, for just like one meal, I'd probably take you to either Joe's Kansas City or uh, LC's Barbecue. Those are two of my favorites. Uh, they're really different. One is very popular. One is very old school. Uh, mm-hmm. But they're, uh, I mean, the food will melt in your mouth and you'll you'll think you've never had anything as good in your whole life. So what is your favorite thing? Are there different things to order at each of those places that you like? You know, I, I'm one who I've always just kind of at a barbecue place. I like to keep it simple. I, I love just a good brisket, uh, sandwich, uh, and, um, you know, whatever sides, you know, I always think like a good tell on a barbecue place is how good are their baked beans. And mm. you can very quickly tell if they put some thought and love into the baked beans or if they just came out of a can. And if they, if they put some thought and love into it, then the rest of the food on the, on the menu is going to be great too. I think I could, I could agree with that. I also, I go by, I like slaw. I feel like slaw is a good mm, yeah. bar- barometer for me. But I'm with you. Brisket's probably my favorite. Although I've started to go a little bit more pulled pork. It's been kind of a nice change, but I'm with you. Brisket. I, I like to think of pulled pork as like a amateur barbecue, but. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, I've been my it's fine. It's there. delicious. I enjoy it. But, you know, anybody could do pulled pork. Yeah. You know, the question is, can you do a good brisket? Can you do good ribs? You know, those sorts of things. Right. So I did a little research on those places, right, to kind of see how to tie it into our, our our episode today. And it was pretty interesting. So, you know, like LC's is the long time, you know, KC place has been around a while. And, uh, you know, Joe's is a little newer, it seemed. Um, but both have a lot of character with LC starting out by cooking his food in a barrel, I think, mm-hmm. when he started out. Um, I think he had retired from some job and then really, you know, probably had barbecued for the family his whole life. And so someone said, start a business. So he did. He doesn't cook it in a barrel anymore. Now they've got this huge smoker thing going. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Joe's started in a gas station. For those places to continue thriving like they have, and like I think Joe's has got now three locations or something, so they're really growing. They need a, a vibrant community around them. Urban design. It's a, it's a passion of yours. And from what I see on LinkedIn, your blog, mm-hmm. your podcast, The Messy City, I can tell this is on your mind a lot. And so let's set the foundation. So what, what are you seeing as some of the biggest challenges facing communities today? Well, I mean, I think that's a, a great takeoff or, or you know, uh, point for us to discuss it coming from the, the world of uh, those barbecue joints because, you know, they were great examples of how people uh, started something uh, they had a passion for inexpensively. Uh, they were able to find a, a location uh, that was probably pretty inexpensive at the time and build success from there and really build wealth uh, for themselves with something that was unique and local. Uh, and uh, one of the challenges that we have in, in a lot of our communities, and this, this, some of this conversation may seem strange, strange from somebody who's a designer uh, by nature, uh, and that's my background at design, but the reality is, you know, 
we have we have an enormous problem in a lot of our cities in our country in that we have um, stagnant or in some cases declining population, but yet we have vastly more land area uh, that people live in than they used to live in. And so let me just use my city uh, as an example. In Kansas City, Missouri, we have about half a million people that live in the city limits. That's about the same amount of people as we had in 1950 in the city limits. But we have four times the land area now in in, uh, the city limits because of annexation and expansion. And uh, so the the net of all that is every person has four times the, the infrastructure that we have to pay for and maintain. And uh, the broader one of the one of the broader problems that we have with American cities is that there's just simply no way to maintain uh, everything that we have built over the last uh, sixty or seventy years. And uh, that's not just the infrastructure, but it's all the operational side of things as well. It translates to how we operate police departments and fire departments and all of the local government services that we uh, rely on uh, on a day-to-day basis. Uh, And so historically, what we have done uh, is, as a prosperous society, whenever we've had these challenges, we just kind of keep throwing more money at it. And uh, we've really hit about the limits of how we can throw more money at these problems to solve them. And uh, it's time for us now to try to think differently. And and learn some lessons from our grandparents and great grandparents and their generation about how they managed uh, life in cities, and and that's really a big focus of what I like to talk about uh, is kind of relearning some of that wisdom from a long time ago and trying to translate that to our modern circumstances. What are a couple of those lessons that come to mind? Top of mind. Well, I I think. Um, you know, for, for one, one of my focus areas for, for many years has been, you know, what we call walkable communities. Well, you know, living in a walkable place is something that everybody did a uh, hundred years ago. Uh, every community in America, no matter how small or big, was a walkable place because th- that's how people got around. Uh, you walked, you rode a bicycle, you took um, uh, a streetcar, uh, perhaps. Uh, and, uh, you know, when the car came in, uh, in in mass in the 19 teens and 20s, that obviously started to change, and uh, now we uh, and then we entered a period that uh, where we completely reoriented our cities around driving, and uh, I th- this is not to um, bemoan uh, the car, uh, cars themselves are uh, are fun, they're a wonderful thing, they provide a great convenience and a lot of freedom. Uh, but what we did in, in our country was we actually destroyed uh, a lot of how our cities worked before the car, uh, and uh, we created a whole new system of planning and building our cities uh, that was uh, very, very different than anything that we had seen before. Uh, and as a result, now uh, the idea of living in a place where you could walk around, like you could, for example, your kids could walk to the store on the corner and get ice cream without adult supervision uh, or where they could ride their bikes around safely. But some of it has had real consequences that are negative that we have to talk about and and we're going to be dealing with for some time. Well, what are, what are a couple of those, uh, you know, consequences that you see that impact cities today more than others? Yeah, so I think the the first thing kind of building on what I said earlier was just the the sheer expense and cost of of our lifestyle today. Uh, And so one aspect of that is what I mentioned before, that we now have uh, communities that we live in that have enormous amounts of infrastructure that have to be maintained. Uh, They have to be built, paid for, that, you know, the pipes, the sewers, the roads, these things don't last forever. They have to be maintained uh, and they're all expensive. Uh, and, uh, so we have, uh, you know, in our communities, we have to figure out how to, how to pay for that in ways that we didn't have to do a long time ago. And then the second way it really is just on the personal side. Uh, so a hundred years ago, the, uh, average household spent, uh, almost nothing basically on transportation. And, uh, today transportation is the second largest expense for every household. Um, as you're talking about that, I, I, I can picture there's probably a couple listeners that are going, wait, you want us to get rid of our cars? Kev, what are you? 
but let me, I'll just, let me just insert there. I'll, I'll ask you that question too. Like, I know that's not what you're saying, but right. I do want to say that what I hear you saying is it's, it, it's a choice that even if you want to make it, it's really tough to make. How does a community's mindset impact how they approach these problems? I mean, that's a fascinating uh, question and uh, it, there's probably a lot we could talk about, but I, I think, you know, there, there's so many ways that, um, the sort of narratives that we hear about frequently uh, in society, they impact how we approach problems and solving problems. And I had a great guest on recently who, um, was a, a planner in Akron, Ohio. So Akron, Ohio is probably not a city that most people really give much thought to. Uh, and it's like a lot of Rust Belt cities that has been stagnant for many, many years. Uh, and, uh, he, he had a great approach that was really starting to think about, you know, we, we cannot have a mentality in our city that we're going to just accept decline. We need to have a growth mentality. And, uh, even in the face of challenging circumstances, he felt, he felt strongly that that's the only approach. And, and I tend to agree. I think, you know, for, for a lot of us, um, I, I think your discussion of mindset is interesting, you know, because, you know, there's a big question, do you have a positive outlook or, you know, do you have a cynical outlook, whatever it is. And, but the same is true, you know, cities and communities are nothing more than just collections of individuals and human beings. And so if those individuals have a mentality that, um, their city or their town is, uh, stuck in decline, and that is the only way forward in the future is just managing that decline, um, then you're probably not going to attract uh, people who might ultimately want to be there. And so I think a, a lot of our cities, uh, uh, we would do better to have a growth uh, mentality uh, generally and be excited uh, about what the future could hold uh, and projecting that sort of positive attitude uh, as opposed to uh, being weighed down by too many sort of uh, negative voices. Can you give an example of uh, how a community might do that, like in, maybe an agriculture out in a rural community? Yeah, I mean, boy, that's a great question. It's something I think about a lot because, you know, uh, as you know, uh, uh, Lisa and I both grew up in the same small town, uh, a rural community in central Missouri. Uh, and um, I care a lot about those small towns. And uh, the, the, the reality is most small rural communities in America have not really grown in like over 100 years. Uh, from a population standpoint. Uh, and so how do you project, you know, some sort of a positive mentality in that regard? And it's an enormous challenge. But, you know, I guess the way I, I have always thought about it is, you know, there are, there are things that, uh, there are assets that large cities and suburbs have that attract a lot of people. But there are also assets that smaller communities and small towns have. Uh, and uh, you have to really understand what are the core things that might attract somebody to a smaller place and then really project those as a positive, as a virtue. Uh, so in a, in a smaller town, for example, uh, you can, as a kid, get on a bicycle, for example, and ride all over the whole town pretty safely. Uh, in most cases, that's what I did when I was a kid. Uh, that's not really possible. Like in my neighborhood, uh, I'm not, uh, you know, as much of a, you know, a booster of bicycling uh, as I am, I'm probably not going to let my kids get on a bike and ride, you know, for two or three miles around our part of the city. It's just not, it's just not safe, uh, for them at, at a certain age, but in a smaller town, it probably is safe. Uh, in a smaller community, people know each other and support each other. And there's much more of a communal, uh, bond in a lot of ways that you just don't have in a larger place. And smaller communities have a direct connection to agriculture um, and food, which, which is a pretty big deal. So, I mean, I think there are assets that every place has, and uh, <clears throat> it's, the challenge is really for any place trying to think about, you know, what those are and project those. Uh, and, and I think it, we're in an era where a lot of people are really rethinking those relationships right now anyway, especially uh, with events of the last few years. And it's probably, it's a phenomenal time for a lot of smaller towns to really uh, project uh, their positive uh, nature uh, and and try to attract people instead of just thinking that they're going to be in a world of managed, you know, stasis or decline. So besides uh, mindset, what are some of the other hurdles that you see standing in the way of a community engaging in strong redevelopment? 
Well, I mean, I think one of the things that I come across uh, a lot is, um, well, there's, there's a couple of things. One is, you know, as I alluded to earlier, um, about a hundred years ago, uh, we dramatically reinvented how we manage our cities. And this is something that most people don't even know about or have, or don't, you know, give much thought to today because it was so long ago. Um, but you know, a hundred years ago, our cities didn't have zoning. They didn't have city planning commissions. Uh, they didn't have, uh, parking regulations. They didn't have building codes. Uh, and, um, you know, that seems anachronistic to us today. Like that's a crazy thing, but think about also what happened, uh, in that era and, uh, and how the problems of that era were different from the ones we have today. So let, let me give an example from, um, in about the 1880s or early 1880s, we had a population of about 30 million people in the United States over the next 30 years we uh, brought in 30 million immigrants, uh, largely from Europe, uh, largely very, very poor. Uh, so uh, essentially doubling our population uh, in that time frame uh, with this, you know, mass wave of immigration. We did all that uh, in a scenario where there, there was effectively no regulation or very little regulation on how cities were built. Uh, and in that era, we just happened to build almost every really great neighborhood that today we love and admire. Uh, we built it in a way that uh, housing affordability was was not an issue uh, in that era. So people um, people coming over and wanting to move around the country could easily go to big cities all over the country and access opportunity uh, for to improve their lives. Um, what we did have a problem with is we had a problem with substandard building in a lot of places. Uh, and so we started adopting building codes, uh, and which most people call fire codes uh, today, but mm. uh, they're actually building codes. And, uh, we did that as a way to fix some of the substandard construction problems, which were causing issues in cities. Uh, and unfortunately we added a whole bunch of other stuff as well to, uh, you know, manage our cities in ways that had never been managed before. And now what we're seeing is a hundred years later, uh, what has happened is that apparatus that we've created cannot react quickly enough to changing circumstances. And so in most of the country, we have a housing affordability problem, uh, and because, uh, we simply cannot build enough housing quickly enough in places that are in high demand to meet, you know, to meet the, meet the demand. What are, can you talk, touch on a little bit on maybe some of the um, hurdles would be the negative views on tax abatements, uh, the, the word gentrification, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Can you touch on that a little bit? Well, again, this is a, this is a challenge. It's so interesting when people talk about these issues, and and they're admittedly very complex. But you know, I think if I say the word gentrification to ten different people, I'm going to get ten different definitions of like what that is, and whether it's uh, whether it's a good thing or whether it's like the worst thing uh, ever. And uh, there are there are real issues related to change uh, in our cities, uh, and. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we we seem uh, again. This is goes back to the mindset question. I think we're 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 in this place where we tend to have adopted negative views of a lot of these a lot of these things instead of trying to focus on the positive uh, aspect uh, of change. So it, it used to be, you know, not long ago that any kind of new development in struggling areas was seen as a good thing, new investment, new opportunity, new housing, new and better housing. And now we have hit a point where that is largely viewed in a negative frame. And, and I'm not here to say that there aren't, ne you know, issues that need to be dealt with. Um, but it's fascinating to see how uh, things that were fairly normal and viewed as positive in terms of change not long ago are really viewed in a negative uh, aspect today. Uh, and so we've got a lot of those issues where we're talking about, you know, gentrification. Tax abatements themselves are a very controversial area. Uh, a lot of that, it, um, you know, comes from, you know, look, the reality of people in my world and in my industry and in development planning do a terrible job of explaining <laughs> tax abatement issues. 
uh, and why they think they're necessary, why they're useful. Uh, and so it's very easy then to attack them uh, and attack those um, approaches uh, because it's it's seen as like a corporate welfare thing. And sometimes it is. Uh, sometimes it has been used in very, very poorly or in abusive manners. Um, but in struggling communities, uh, we have created incentives for people to try to uh, develop um, because they're because there are challenges, because it's harder and more expensive to develop there than on the edge uh, of a of a suburban area, and that's why we have these some of those tax abatement and incentive policies. And um, you know, again, there's a lot of nuance with those, and and a lot that we could debate. But it's it's fascinating how, by and large, today they're they're viewed in a very uh, negative uh, uh, outlook. Uh, if you if you were to read about them in almost any publication. Let's, let's start to look to the future. Um, um, what does the world look like um, if we are able to move forward and overcome some of the redevelopment struggles that you've shared with us and that you think about on a you know, day-to-day basis? A lot of people uh, reconnecting to something they know that they enjoy, uh, that they enjoy moving around, um, using their own bodies to move around, whether it's walking or, or riding a bike. Uh, and that they enjoy connecting with other people as they walk by and see them, you know, on the street or in a public space. Uh, and, and, and those are real, uh, virtues that are, that are truly wonderful, uh, for, for, for many of us. So I think that that's a great thing that's happened. And I think parallel to that has been a, a real, a rebirth in interest in local, um, economies, uh, in the last couple of decades. And so, uh, you know, I think those two things tend to go hand in hand, uh, that uh, the more interest that people have at, at the neighborhood and community scale, the more we're going to have like local businesses and entrepreneurs uh, and and local economies uh, that also tie into people understanding how to build wealth for themselves again, as opposed to, uh, you know, maybe uh, how we've thought about it the last few decades that we could look to some of those historic uh, methods for building wealth. And all of those things really reinforce each other. And I, I, I I'm excited I think when I get excited, I get excited for seeing how the future can, you know, is the future is almost like a, a, a wonderful extension of things that happened a hundred years ago that people are coming back to and, and starting to value again. And so I, I think there are modern takes on that, that, that are really uh, exciting to think about. So you do talk to those in the public and private sectors. I haven't heard every episode, but um, can you share some of the lessons that you've learned about how those in the public and private sectors are, what they're doing to fix the cities either separately or together? Yeah. I mean, I think you know, we're starting to get uh, younger generations of people on the public side that are coming into leadership roles, which is great. And, and they tend to be more eager to experiment um, with ways to, to take on these issues, which is really, really wonderful because we had a lot of years where we had people who just were kind of stuck in the mud and didn't really want to even experiment with, you know, maybe changing a street or changing a zoning ordinance or something like that. And so there's much, much more experimentation going on now, which is great. On the private side, you know, I, I have just become totally enamored the last, you know, decade or so with people who undertake development, uh, real estate development projects, you know, on their own in their communities. And, uh, I really encourage people to think about real estate development as, as I know it can count, maybe it sounds scary or, or unreachable for a lot of people. It's really not, you know, if, if you, um, if, if you build a house for yourself, you're a developer. Uh, if you build an expansion onto your house, uh, or build a granny flat in the back, you're a developer and it's not, it's not so unlearnable that you can't be the uh, person who solves development problems in your own neighborhood or your own community. And uh, I, I'm one of the things I've been fortunate to do is interview a number of those people on my podcast who who have taken on that role, uh, especially here in Kansas City. But um, because those are the people that I uh, I know the best. But I. I, I I really love hearing their stories about how, you know, how they came to that experience, how the risks they took, the risks they didn't take, successes and failures they've had, and, and what they can teach others, especially especially younger people, about trying to encourage them to get into that world. And what can I do to start to make my community a little bit more vibrant and move towards some of these positive changes you're seeing? 
One, one thing I would suggest is there's a great organization called Strong Towns, which is really good to connect with. And one, they have an amazing uh, uh, website and media apparatus, uh, multiple podcasts, and they really try to help people identify small improvements uh, that, that anybody could make in their community, uh, no matter what your background. And, and, and one of the, the mottos there is to just identify some small area where uh, people are struggling. So, for example, is there, is there a street that is just difficult to cross? Uh, is, is there, um, you know, is there a place where there's a, a lack of shade where having trees would help and identifying those things and then just figuring out how can I be the person to help solve that problem? Uh, and sometimes those solutions are going to be really simple and easy and, and very inexpensive. And some of them may take a little longer. Like if you like need a new crosswalk or, uh, a median to make it safer to cross the street, you might find that takes a little while, but that's something any citizen can do and bring to their uh, city government to uh, to take on. And there are in very inexpensive ways to experiment now with, with improvements like that. So that's one great way. And then, you know, as I mentioned before, I, I really encourage people to think about um, real estate development, not as this very crazy, um, intimidating black box that um, they could never possibly do. But think about maybe that's, you know, if there's a problem in my neighborhood, I, I, I recently had a, on a guest uh, from uh, South Bend, uh, Indiana, a retired professor who just got frustrated with uh, some empty buildings and empty lots in his neighborhood. And he took on the task of figuring out how to purchase, renovate, and bring life to those. And, and it's remarkable. His, his story is incredible. And I, I listen to that and I think, you know, that's something that, that anybody could do, but it's really just about having the right mindset that says, yeah, this is a problem I can take on. Why not? What did he, what's a couple of things he did to make it, make it a better property? Well, he was able to figure out how to, uh, the one vacant building, it was a vacant commercial building in his area, how to uh, purchase it and renovate it very inexpensively and then go find a tenant. Uh, and, uh, that, that's not, that's something that may sound intimidating to a lot of people. It's really not, it's really not all that hard, especially in many communities where, um, real estate, if you're in a place where real estate's not very expensive. Uh, and then he also was able to partner with others, find people who had knowledge that he didn't have, um, to help basically build, uh, a new housing on vacant lots in his area, uh, that really he felt like his neighborhood would benefit from having that new housing. And it has. And in, in the end, his efforts and the efforts of people who he has partnered with in his community have really helped revitalize and restore an area that was struggling uh, very much. And again, not in a high growth community uh, at all. Oh, actually, I do want to step back a minute. What is the organization you work for now? I think K yeah. Midtown KC Now? Is that Yes, it's called Midtown correct? KC Now. Okay. what we call a, a place management organization. You know, we work with uh, community and economic development in the Midtown area in Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, we manage a couple of uh, self-taxing districts, which uh, in Missouri are called community improvement districts. So those are like a clean and safe program that we run uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week to help uh, just help the area. But we also do a lot of work uh, at the grassroots level and in trying to improve uh, public space and and help our area continue to get better. Well, Kevin, how would someone find if their community has something like this? You might look at the International Downtown Association. I think their website is downtown or downtowns.org, something like that. Uh, they're, they're sort of a trade association for groups like ours, and, and uh, there are member groups uh, all, over, all over America and Canada and beyond. Okay, I'll uh, do a little research, and those will be in the show notes um, uh, afterwards, everyone, if you want to check those out. So anyway, so Kev, you do have a, a, a website and a blog you've run for a period of time and a podcast that you just started this year. So we are podcast twins, I think. <laughs> uh, can you maybe share a little bit about kind of what, what that's about? Yeah, I, imagine. I, you know, I, I've just always enjoyed writing and speaking and just sharing thoughts and trying to talk with people about these issues. I, I just, I, I'm a weird guy that from when I was a kid, I had an interest in cities and architecture and planning and, and, um, 
so I kind of always like knew what I wanted to do, which is, I, I know, very strange. Um, but I have enjoyed writing about these issues for a long time and, and have done that. I When the blogging thing became uh, a new way to share thoughts, I jumped on board with that in the 2000s. And uh, I've been doing that now for, like you said, for probably 20 years. Uh, and, uh, I, I don't write as much as I used to just simply because I just don't have as much time. If you've got a family, you understand <laughs> there's a lot of, a lot of constraints when you have a job and a family and everything else. Um, so I have, but I have shifted over and been doing the podcast this year and I really enjoy that. Uh, so it's all, uh, everything's on Substack at, uh, you can find the messy city on Substack. There's also a website, the messy but all of my new materials on Substack these days. And, uh, hopefully I'll get back to writing a little bit more, uh, as time allows. Cause I, I do enjoy that, but uh, I really like writing about cities and, and people and, and, um, urban design. It's just, just a big interest in mine. I like to focus, close our conversations, Kevin, on the why of what we do. And I feel like you maybe touched on this throughout the <laughs> throughout the time together, but what motivates you to do this day in and day out? What keeps you excited and passionate about what you do? You know, I, I think I, I guess I've just had this innate desire, uh, for a long time. I, 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 I oftentimes come back to that, uh, uh, well, let me just say it this way. I, I watched a lecture the other day, uh, from the former mayor of Charleston, South Carolina, Joe Riley, who was mayor there for almost 40 years. He was just a real legend in that part of the country. And he had, he was an, had an amazing way of talking about cities and people who live in them. And, you know, one of the things that he said that I just always felt was true is, um, I strive, I, I want to leave the world, uh, a more beautiful and, uh, better place for, you know, my kids and, and their kids. And I think that's, uh, I think it's an important goal for all of us to try to improve civilization and improve people's opportunities to succeed uh, in life and have a good life. And um, I do it in my little weird corner of the world uh, where I can, uh, but that's, that's a big part of what motivates me. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for being here. It's been great to have you on the show and rock chalk. <laughs> Absolutely, rock chalk. That was my conversation with Kevin Klinkenberg, Executive Director at Midtown KC Now. You can connect with Kevin and what he's working on by heading to the links in the show notes. In fact, that is my takeaway for this episode. I would encourage you to check out Kevin's blog and his podcast, The Messy City, and some of the other links that we share in the show notes. And I'm telling you, they will be inspiring for what if you want to see change in the way your community is built and what it will look like in the future. If you enjoyed this episode, you can help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving a five-star rating in your favorite podcast player. Thanks for listening to this episode of Keeping the Lights On. We'll see you next time.